You are listening to a sermon by Dr. Richard Caldwell produced by Walking in Grace. Walking in Grace is a listener-supported ministry. Visit walkingingrace.org media to learn how you can help these messages reach more people. Well, it is good to see you this evening. If you would please turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. As I said last week, we were spending a few Sunday evenings in this 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians because it represents a, a good wellness check uh, for us to walk through from time to time. As we think about how we're doing in our relationships with each other in the church, at home, in all realms of our life, as we think about how we're walking with the Lord in the midst of this world that tests us in so many different ways, this is a good place to come to periodically and remind ourselves of what the standard is and then examine ourselves in light of that standard. And So tonight we're going to read beginning at verse 1, we'll read down to verse 8. Our focus will be especially on verses 4 and 5 this evening. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning with verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Is not jealous. Does not brag. Is not puffed up. It does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. Let's go to our God together in prayer. Lord, as was already prayed, we thank you for these regular times we have to be washed with the pure water of the Word of God, to be put before the mirror of truth, both to to be filled with gratefulness for the things you have done in our lives, but also to recognize the work that is still to be done. And so I pray that tonight will be an encouraging night and that we will see what you have done in our lives, the ways, Lord, that now we do love, that we did not before we knew you, but also be challenged by the need to abound more and more in this quality that has been given to us through salvation, poured out in our hearts by your Spirit, modeled by our Savior, and that, Lord, which you display toward us every single day. Lord, would you grow us in our ability to be like our Father who is in heaven and like our Savior who is our shepherd. We will thank you for what you do in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. In the first part of this section, we were reminded of the priority of love. Paul engages in purposeful hyperbole. He envisions all sorts of giftedness and all sorts of ability and all sorts of sacrifice and yet tells us that all of that, even that which is humanly impossible, Eloquence that matches the angels, gifts that are without number, sacrifice 
down to the level of our own martyrdom. If we have all of that, we don't have love. It means absolutely nothing. So the priority of love is set before us in those first three verses. Then in verses 8 through 12, 8 through 13, the permanence of love is set before us. Its priority is emphasized by its longevity. There are things that God has ordained that belong to us that we even exercise in terms of giftedness that fit the age in which we're living, but there will come a time when some of that goes away. It's no longer active. It's no longer needed. But when we reach the state of eternity, love will still be there. So you think about the priority of love and you think about the permanence of love and what is heightened when we really let that sink in upon us is the need to practice love. If it has this priority given by God, if it has this permanence ordained by God, then certainly we need to examine ourselves and ask, are we, are we living it out? Are we walking in it? This is the life that we've been commanded to live, a life of love. We're told to walk in the love of God. Whenever you see that word walk in the New Testament, you know it has to do with a lifestyle. It's to be our our consistent practice. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, the Bible says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is what pleases our God when we live as our Savior lives for us. He loved us and gave himself up for us. And the Spirit of God tells us now, you, you walk in that love. So this is to be our consistent practice. We're not to love sporadically. We're to love consistently. This is to be the, the character of our lives, the love of God in practice as people who've been saved. But we know what a challenge that is for us. Though the Lord has saved us and poured out His love in our hearts, the flesh is still there. And there's a battle with the world that still exists. And so this is where we almost also must purpose to grow. I want to grow in the consistent practice of the love of God. In fact, the New Testament describes it as abounding in love. Not only growing in love, but in a way that it sort of overflows in my life where it will be evident both to myself and to others that I'm walking in the love of God. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul praying, he says this, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. And then he identifies the, the nature of this love. It's, it's not sentimentality. It's not some sort of shallow, naive emotion. Because he says this, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. The love of God being lived out in the realm of truth, a belief in the truth, faith works, which will include discerning that which is right on the side of God and that which he does not approve of. Walk in that kind of love, abound in that kind of love. We, see, we saw this in our study of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 3, 12, again a prayer. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. And so what follows the explanation of the priority of love and what precedes the explanation of the permanence of love is a description, a list of qualities that you find wherever you find the love of God in practice. We began looking at this last Sunday evening. We saw that love is defined as it is described. It is being defined both in terms of what it chooses for and what it chooses against. Reminding us that, that love is not measured simply by words. We see this in the world all the time. We, we've seen it in our own lives, if we'll be honest that we substitute speech for reality. Let me use words that I think are loving words, but 
I'm not practicing loving actions along with those words. Love isn't measured simply by words. Love isn't measured simply by your feelings. I feel these things for you, therefore I must be loving you. Well, are your feelings representative of your actions? Are your feelings accurate when it comes to what you're actually choosing, what you're choosing for, what you're choosing against? You may feel that you love God, for example, but are you making choices every day in this world that would accord with what you claim are those feelings? Love isn't measured simply by your emotions. Love isn't measured simply by your intentions. We've all known what it is to have good intentions, but not to follow through on our intentions. No, love is a matter of practice. A few things I want you to think about before we continue looking at the practice of love. First, I would remind us this is something that is supernatural. Supernatural. We are a supernaturally formed people. Salvation has formed us. And the lives that we're called to live now reflect that supernatural work. This is not something, the love of God, this is not something natural to us. We weren't born with it. Everything in this list is contrary to what men and women are without Jesus. Only Christians can live out what is in this list. Only, only after regeneration has happened, only after the new birth, only after you're a new creation in Christ Jesus do you even have the capacity to live what is being described here. You could, you could take this list and say just by, by sheer discipline and self-will, I will strive to live this out and you will find it impossible because everything in this list requires the heart given by God through salvation to be able to live it out. Even if you lived it out externally in ways that look good to the eyes of men, the heart necessary to have really lived it out will be missing. So just know that what you're meeting with here is not, is not something you can do in your own strength. It's not something that is natural to human beings. This is supernatural. Second thing I would point out about this list is it has a pastoral purpose in the context of 1 Corinthians. I want you to remember this is a church that's been struggling in a myriad of areas, a church in which they have mistreated each other, so much so that they are rebuked even over abuses around the Lord's table, a church in which people had sued each other in court, defrauded each other. I mean, this is a church that is struggling relationally in a lot of different areas so that this beautiful description of the love of God has a pastoral purpose. It is meant to correct things that are out of order in the life of the church. How does that help us? Well, show me any church that is currently experiencing relational difficulties Churches full of controversy, churches full of infighting, churches filled with behaviors that don't accord with Scripture. It would be a really helpful thing for those churches to go to this chapter and realize that what, is, what really would be the answer for their problems is to walk in the love of God. And what is true of the church is also true when you move inward into the relationships we all have in life. So if you ask, what is wrong in my family? What is wrong in my marriage? What is wrong in the raising of my children? What is wrong in my friendships? What is wrong in my relationships at work? If you, if you take any set of relationships and you recognize that there's something diseased right now, there's something out of order, a good answer for you would be to go to this chapter and say, Lord, I know this, if I walk in your love, that is where I will find spiritual health. And so if we long to have a spiritually healthy marriage, let my wife and I or my husband, and I, let us go to this chapter and really consider, are we loving each other? Not by the standards of the culture, not by the standards of our own measure, but by the standards of your love. Are we loving each other? So this is a corrective in the context of 1 Corinthians. Third, though it is a corrective for the church at Corinth, it is universal in its application. There's a reason why this is one of the most beloved chapters in all the Bible. 
because we all struggle in one way or another with the very things the Corinthians were struggling with. Our church may not have the exact same issues that the church at Corinth had, but this church has issues. Every church has issues. We all as, as saved human beings have issues in all of our relationships. So this is universal in its application. You don't have to be a part of the Corinthian congregation to recognize this would be helpful for us tonight, for this church, for our relationships. And then fourth, I would point out that one of the great problems in Corinth was disunity. This is a chapter that brings about genuine unity. This is for the edification of the people of God. This is for the unified functioning of the people of God. And so if the need is unity, love is the answer. He's not just telling us what love results in. He's telling us what love is so that wherever love is absent, what he's really saying is, these practices are absent. So, so, for example, those first three verses, the priority of love. If you have all sorts of eloquence, but you are not patient, you're not kind, you are jealous, you brag, you're puffed up, you go on down the list, that would mean you're a noisy gong. You're a clanging cymbal. If you consider yourself to be full of all sorts of spiritual gifts and even people recognize how gifted you are, but you're not patient and you're not kind and you are jealous and you do brag, go on down the list. Well, what that would mean is that you are nothing. And no matter what your giving right now is financially or how you sacrifice materially, Maybe even people recognize, look how sacrificial he or she is. Look at what they sacrifice for the sake of others. If you do all of that, but you're not patient, you're not kind, you're jealous, you brag, you're puffed up, go on down the list, that would mean that it profits you nothing. I want you to recognize that what we're meeting with in this list is what is absent wherever love is absent. So away with the... the the concepts of love that are mere words, mere emotions, mere sentiments. And let's recognize that love is concrete. It is about choices. Not choices that are heartless. The right heart has to be present, but nonetheless, with the right heart, these choices are made both in the positive and the negative, what we're choosing for, what we're choosing against if we're really walking in the love of God. So what is love? Last time we saw this, love is patient. Love is patient. Tonight we begin with the next quality. He says love is kind. And what I want to point out is that these two qualities are actually connected. I think it's right for us to think for a moment about how patience and kindness relate to each other because you will notice after these first two qualities, he now begins to deal with the negative understanding of the love of God, what it is not. It is not jealous. It does not brag. It is not puffed up. In fact, there's a long list of what love isn't, but he begins with these two qualities when he wants to describe love in the positive sense. Love is patient and love is kind. Why does he join these two qualities together at the beginning of his list? Why are these the two positive qualities that he begins with? I think because these two qualities are best understood when we look to God himself. Patience and kindness considered from the standpoint of how these two qualities are found in God, demonstrated by God himself. For example, Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself, 
because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who do such things. Do you suppose, oh man, you who judge those who do such things, right? He's, he's envisioning someone who knows the law of God, and with the law of God in their minds, they look at the world around them, and they're able to identify and condemn everyone else's sin, even while they live in the same sins. He's talking about unregenerate Jews, for example, who are legalists. They know the law, and they rightly condemn what is sin in other people, not recognizing they themselves need forgiveness and conversion. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who do such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? And then he says this, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Have you missed the riches of God's kindness and patience toward you. What is patience in that context? It is God not giving men what they deserve at that very moment. Those who have sinned against God deserve the wrath and judgment of God, are fully responsible for what they have done. In fact, they're able to recognize it in others and they condemn it in others even as they practice it themselves. If anybody deserved judgment, it's them, but God has not yet judged them. And instead, with that patience, he has joined to it goodness. He has not only not judged them, he continues to be good to them even while they deserve Judgment. So patience, the love of God in action in sort of a passive way. What God doesn't give, mercy. He withholds what he could give them because he's merciful toward them. At the very same time, he is kind to them in what sense? He is pouring out blessings upon them they don't deserve. The love of God passively expressed by what it doesn't give, the love of God actively expressed by what it does give. And I want to offer to you this evening that this, this, this is how these two qualities are joined together in our lives as well. We have people who mistreat us. We have people who are difficult to deal with. The love of God means we deal with them patiently. We're not returning evil for evil. We're not even giving them what they deserve sometimes when we could and be justified in doing so, we withhold that. That's called mercy. But we do more than that. At the very same time, we do good toward them. We bless them. We bless those who curse us. That's kindness, you see. That's kindness. Patience and kindness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, our Lord teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, he said this, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which was actually a misapplication of the law of God. They took what was a legal standard in terms of the function of the government and their nation, and they were applying it to personal disputes. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? 
Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You live out in your relationships what you see in your heavenly Father, which is He is patient and He is kind. Luke 6, 26, Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Now, can you I'm going to read a couple more verses, but I just want you to think with me for just a moment how this would transform marriages. He's talking about your enemies doing good to those who hate you, blessing those who curse you, praying for those who abuse you. We're called to be patient and kind to our enemies. Is the standard lower when it comes to the people in your own home? Are you being patient and kind in your own family? Ephesians 4.32, now addressing relationships between believers. Verse I read a moment ago, Luke 6, deals with the believer's relationship to unbelievers. This verse deals with the believer's relationship to believers. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. This is one of the greatest problems we face in sin. Sin would harden our hearts. Sin would make us insensitive to each other. Sin would bring us to a point that we don't care. Are you caring about your relationships? Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. What makes your heart hard? Unforgiveness. What makes you insensitive to other people? In some cases, it's unforgiveness. You just haven't really forgiven them. You say you have, but you haven't. And the evidence that you haven't is your attitude toward them. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. If you know that you needed forgiveness, would you say amen? If you believe Jesus gave you that forgiveness, would you say amen? Is there anyone in your life tonight you haven't given that same forgiveness to? Is there anyone that, as we'll get to eventually, we won't tonight, but love doesn't keep a record of wrongs? Anybody, you, you've got the tab, right? You've got the list. You've got the list you're keeping. When all of your offenses were nailed to the cross of Christ and paid for in full dropped into the sea of forgetfulness, not to be brought up again. As God in Christ forgave you, believer, be kind to your brothers and sisters, tender-hearted, forgiving them from your heart. This, again, is one of the <clears throat> requirements for church leaders, for all of us, generally speaking, as we serve the Lord, but specifically for those of us who have the privilege to lead in some way in the church's life. 2 Timothy 2.24 says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach. Listen again to how these two qualities are often linked up. Kind to everyone, able to teach. Next statement, patiently enduring evil. Can you patiently endure mistreatment even while you practice kindness to everyone? Verse 25 says this, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth and they may escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. That's your motive. 
This is, this is a part of the heart that stands behind this behavior. What I want for you is spiritual good. What I want for you is release from the snare of Satan. You're captured. You just don't know it. And I want to see you set free. And knowing how God has been merciful to me and how he freed me from the snare I could have never freed myself from, that grants to me an understanding that produces the patience and the kindness, even when mistreated. So you see these two qualities joined together. I'm not saying this is the only thing that patience is, withholding judgment or withholding evil for evil, but I am saying it is interesting to me how this is joined to kindness in our verses and how often you see these two qualities joined together in God himself and in what he exhorts from us, his people. And when they're joined together, it involves both love and Passive in the sense of what it doesn't give and active in the sense of what it does give. It doesn't give evil things. It gives good things. Refuses to give sometimes even what people deserve. That's patience. And instead gives kindness. Love is, love is kind. Love is patient. Love is kind. Third, love is not, now we get, begin to look at what it isn't, love is not jealous. Love is not jealous. And the word translated jealous there can be used positively of zeal, but obviously this, this is not the positive use of the word. And when it's used negatively, what it speaks of is still a kind of zeal. It, in fact, the word itself comes from a a root that has to do with boiling. And so it, it's describing something going on in your heart, sort of a boiling going on in your heart. And what it's talking about is this, a sinful resentment over what you perceive someone else to have that you feel minimizes you in some way. Right? They have that, but they shouldn't have that. They have that, but if anybody should have it, I should have that. Jealous. Sinfully resentful about what someone else has. That's not the love of God. Love is the opposite of that. In fact, love cares about other people in a way that we're able to share in their circumstances both in grief and in rejoicing. We, we prefer others above ourselves. We care about them genuinely in such a way that when they suffer, we hurt with them. And when they are blessed, we rejoice with them. There's no jealousy there, you see. We love them. If we remember we're all part of one body, if we remember that our union in Christ, it's sort of like a marriage. How can you be jealous of the person you're married to when you're one? <laughs> Whatever happens to them in a way that hurts them, it hurts you because you're one. And whatever happens to them in a way that blesses them or showers praise on them in some way, you are full of joy because they're yours. You're one with them. And the same is true in the relationships we have in the church. We are one body in Christ Jesus. How can we be jealous of each other? The Corinthians needed to learn this. In fact, in just the previous chapter, chapter 12, look what he writes. Let's just look at verse 25. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Verse 26, and if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. That's the love of God. So just for the purpose of examination tonight, let me ask, is there anybody you're, you're aware of that you have been jealous of them? You resent someone else's strengths. You resent someone else's successes. You resent someone else getting recognition or admiration. Someone thinks highly of them. 
th this is one of the ways you recognize jealousy. Someone thinks highly of another person, and you go to work immediately to try to tear down that admiration. Well, yeah, but if you knew them the way I know them. You resent another person's opportunities. Why do they get to do that? And I don't get to do that. Why do they get to preach? I don't get to preach. Why do they get to sing? I don't get to sing. Why do they get to serve in that way? I don't get to do that. Why did they get chosen to do this or that? I, I haven't had that opportunity. Jealousy. You resent someone else's blessings from the Lord. I mean, if you want to see how wicked we can still be even after being saved, wait until you meet with a time where there's this boiling sort of thing going on in your heart because your brother has been blessed in some way. This may not ever come out of your mouth. In fact, you, you knowing that it's wicked may try to hide it. But if it's going on in your heart, it's a sin issue. Are you ready to mortify that? Are you ready to recognize it as sin and put it to death? This is not what it means to love people. And so wherever there is that resentment in your heart because someone else is, is treated in a way that you think you deserve or you feel like in some way it minimizes you, just realize that is not God's love, which means it is sinful. Lord, help me not to be a jealous person. Love does not boast, verse 4, does not brag. On the one hand, it doesn't feel minimized by the successes of others or the blessings of others or the strengths of others. On the other side, it doesn't attempt to minimize others by building itself up. You see, this is the other side, isn't it? I either want to tear down what I see in you, that's jealousy, or I want to build myself up in a way that minimizes you, that's bragging. Boasting in yourself. There is an appropriate kind of boasting. It's boasting in the Lord. It's boasting in Christ. It is making much of our God and our Savior even making much of his blessings to us in that we realize we don't deserve them and we give him praise and thanks for what he has given to us. But what is completely out of, out of keeping with what we are as believers is for us to build ourselves up, exalt ourselves in a way that really also represents not loving other people because as we build ourselves up, we're putting everyone else down below Wherever you find bragging, you find blindness. Know this. When you find yourself tempted to brag, remind yourself it's impossible to be a braggart without being blind. You say, what am I blind to when I'm bragging? You're blind to the source of whatever it is you want to brag about. Who gave you what you have? So why would we boast about anything as if it's explained by us? Whatever it is you are tempted to think highly of yourself about, I want to ask you, where did that come from? You think highly of what? I mean, just fill in the blank. You think highly of your intelligence. Well, are you responsible for that? I mean, did you do that for yourself? You think highly of the money you have. What? Did you really do that for yourself? Oh, yes, you don't know how hard I work. You don't know the good decisions I made. I mean, if I hadn't made this decision then and that decision there and that decision over there, well, I would have never had what I have. Uh, who gave you the health you have to make those decisions? Who brought about the circumstances that gave you the opportunity to make those decisions? Who gave you the wisdom in those moments to make those decisions? That didn't come from you. And if you ever lose sight of that, just wait until you make the wrong decision. And all of a sudden, all of that high and lofty thinking about yourself is stripped bare when God brings you to a point where you see just how vulnerable you are if He just lets you make the wrong decision. 
Blessed with health, God gave you that. Blessed with your family, God gave you that. What do you have that God didn't give you? Paul had to wake up the Corinthian church with that very kind of challenge. 1 Corinthians 4, 7, for who sees anything different in you? I love that first line. (laughs) He's shaking them up at that level. I know you think you're the greatest thing ever, but who else thinks that? Who sees anything different in you? You think you're grand, but who else thinks you're grand? That's a good reminder to us sometimes, isn't it? For the braggart. But he goes on to say this, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Why do you boast as if you're the source of it? So whenever we're bragging, we have forgotten where whatever it is we're wanting to brag about, where it came from and who it's explained by. We also forget why God gives us things. Whatever it is you are tempted to brag about, can I ask, why did God give that to you? Why? your wonderful mind or the material things you have or the family you have or the opportunity, the job you have. Why did he give that to you? And the answer is he didn't give it to you just for you. Yes, he gives us all things richly to enjoy, but he also gives us what we have to be invested in his name. We exist for his glory and for the good of others. We don't live selfish lives. We live giving lives. This is the love of God. And so God, even when it comes to spiritual gifts, what does he do? He gives gifts to profit the whole body for his glory, for the good of others. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. He's, he is correcting the Corinthian church about that very attitude that some think of themselves in a lofty way because of the spiritual gift they have and think lowly about others. You're just a foot. You're just a hand. You're nothing. And he corrects them with the knowledge that, no, whatever gift God has given, he's given for the profit of the whole body. Verse 14 of of 1 Corinthians 12, For also the body is not one member but many. For if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has appointed the members, each of them, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, how much more is it that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary? And he goes on. You need a corrective in your thinking whenever you're tempted to brag. Where did it come from, whatever you have? Who gave it to you? And why did he give it to you? Not just for you, but for his glory and for the good of others. Finally, I would also mention at the moment you're bragging, you are at the center of your worldview. You have have forgotten that you're to count others more important than yourself. You, in the moment of bragging, are at the center of your worldview. Love isn't that. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous, tearing down what someone else has, love does not brag, building yourself up and in that way tearing others down. Then he says, love is not puffed up. Love is not arrogant. It comes from a word that means bellows. To, to, you know, you've seen the, the, the bellows people use in a fireplace or something like that. To puff up, to blow up, to be inflated is what the word means. This is the attitude that explains the bragging. But you don't have to be bragging to have the attitude. 
You may not be the braggart. You may not be the person that out of your mouth comes this self-praise, but the question is, is the attitude there? Do you have an inflated view of yourself? This is the battle we've got to fight with sin in our own hearts. We can play the role of humility if we're not careful. You can play the role of humility because nothing comes out of your mouth. Very careful about this. The things don't come out of your mouth that sound like pride. But the question is, is the pride in your heart? Is there a puffed up view of yourself in your own mind? It is often the case that those who have accused others of pride are the people who most struggle with pride themselves. Oh, I can't stand pride. Oh, where are the humble people? I want to be with them. Pride is such a terrible thing. All the while you don't recognize it's in your own heart. I think a great biblical example of this is Korah. In the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 16. According to the Old Testament, who was the most humble man on the earth at the time he was on the earth? Remember his name? The most humble man? Moses. Moses. And you have a man named Korah who is going to accuse Moses of pride. Number 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, son of Kohath, son of Levi... And Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation. We're going to go with the, with the men of renown, well-known men, the Bible says. Chosen from the assembly, well-known men, they assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far for all in the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. I mean, doesn't that sound humble? Moses, who are you and Aaron to be leading us the way you are? Who, who made you so great? Don't you know the Lord is among us all? We're all the people of God. I mean, it just sounds so humble. In fact, he goes on to say this, Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Remember what happened to Korah? The Lord wiped him out. Because the, the man who was accusing Moses of pride was himself arrogant. How insidious sin is, pride is, because it can, like a virus, take root in your life even while you claim that you hate it, even while you claim that you're offended by it. The next time you think someone else is arrogant, can I encourage you to ask yourself a question. Is it really that they are arrogant or is there something about them that is threatening my sense of self-importance? Is it really that they think they're so important or is it that I think I'm so important and they are a threat to my sense of self-importance? Regardless, just know and continue. Let's look at ourselves in the mirror of God's Word and ask, am I, am I arrogant? Because that's not what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not puffed up. Doesn't have an exalted sense of itself. Last one for tonight. It does not act unbecomingly, or we could say this, love is not rude. It does not act shamefully. It does not act disgracefully. It doesn't glory in what is not fitting. 
Again, I, I just marvel fearfully at how deceptive sin is because it's interesting to me. He has just described the braggart and the arrogant person. And so someone may say, yeah, that's right. We need to walk in humility. So you know what? Who cares about manners? Who cares about whether or not these people who are so ostentatious should have their sensitivities respected? I mean, you see this sometimes, don't you? People who think they're being down to earth by showing no sensitivity to what's proper. based upon whatever situation they find themselves in. Can I say to you, you may not be being down to earth. You may be being rude. Love does not act in a way that disregards everyone else's sensibilities. Love doesn't act in a way that doesn't care about what's proper. Love includes a selflessness that is reflected in a consideration of others. What do they perceive to be respectful and mannerly and fitting? That matters. There are people who have actually taken pride in disregarding manners. They walk into a room, they are loud, call attention to themselves, make light of those who actually do care about what's proper. And you might even be right about some of those people being ostentatious. Maybe they are just making a lot of what is just considered human glory. But I tell you what would be wrong, that's you just steamrolling over their sensitivities. And so once again, we're reminded, love isn't focused inward. It takes note of others even down to what is becoming or unbecoming, fitting or not fitting, proper or not proper. Do you care about that? Are are you rude? Or do you so care about others you actually are sensitive to their sensitivities? What's right in this situation? As I stop here tonight, let me, let me just finish by underscoring two things that we see in, in what we've examined so far. One, love includes both passive and active responses. That is to say, passive, what I don't do in response to others, I'm patient, not returning evil for evil, so what I don't do in response to others. And active, what I choose to do in response to others, I am good to them, kind to them. Love involves both. So sometimes when you're choosing the love of God, it is going to mean patience. It's also going to mean kindness. And the second thing I would underscore is there are common points shared in all of these qualities that we've seen so far. What do, they all, what do they all have in common? They all strike at a self-centered perspective. They all argue against, require something different than a self-centered perspective. So a good test for all of us is who's at the center of your worldview? And if it's you, that's not the love of God. Which means if you're at the center of the picture, who is not at the center of the picture? Christ The love of God has Christ at the center of the picture. And so when you think about your your life, especially in relationship to other people, is Jesus in view? Like, am I responding to you in a way that I would if Christ was on my mind? Am I responding to you in a way that would actually be aiming at honoring Jesus given these circumstances or this situation or this conflict, I want to respond in a way that honors the Lord Jesus Christ. And the final thread that runs through all of these 
They're all against a self-centered perspective. They're all arguing for a Christ-centered perspective. They deal with the whole person. You can't practice any of this and compartmentalize what the responses are in terms of your your life. It, It affects the whole of the life. Love is going to be seen in our words. Love is going to be found in our thinking. Love will show up in our attitudes. Love will show up in our behaviors, our choices. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. Lord, would you help us to walk in what you gave us when you saved us? You gave us the love of your Son. Would you help us to walk in that love and to abound in that love more and more so that it will be evident both to us and to others that we're learning to walk in a manner that's fitting with respect to our Savior and our salvation. Amen? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity we have as a church and that I have as an individual disciple that each of us has to examine ourselves in the light of the mirror of your word. Forgive us, Lord, where we have not loved. Forgive us where we are not loving. And by your grace and by your spirit, produce that fruit in us, the fruit of your love that we know you will. And so wherever we're needing to grow, wherever we need to abound more and more in this love you've given us, Lord, would you strengthen us to walk in it. Save us, Lord, from the blindness that we described tonight. Save us, Lord, from the insensitivity, the hard-heartedness that would not represent your love. Strengthen us to really care about each other, both in your church and when we go home, so that with a clear conscience we can say we're striving to walk in the love of Jesus in every part of our lives. We'll give you thanks for what you do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.